My name is Dr. Ethel Tungohan. I'm a writer, a researcher, an associate professor of politics, and an activist. This is Academic Aunties. In today's episode, we will be talking about gendered racialized violence in the academy. Some of what we will be talking about might be hard to hear, so please, dear listeners, be gentle with yourselves as you listen. This time a year ago, I was in a dark place. A so-called friend slash colleague published a social media screed that contained hateful allegations against me that, as these things often do, circulated widely. I got doxxed and cyber harassed, with my inbox becoming a cesspool of gendered racialized violence. There were rape threats against me and my children. I had to shut everything down online. It was an awful time. A few months later, a far-right political figure mentioned my name and my institutional affiliation on his social media accounts, disparaging a workshop for Black, Indigenous, and racialized academics that I was co-organizing. Again, I had to shut down my social media accounts. My colleagues and I also had to make sure that our event was safe for everyone involved. This time around, I knew what to do. These are only two examples of gender racialized violence that I face in my time as a professor, but these were probably the worst I faced. And I'm not alone. Gender racialized violence is commonplace and is escalating. According to Saida Grundy, who is writing about white violence facing Black professors, such violence can include, quote, harassment, stalking, surveillance and calls for termination, physical threats that are gendered and sexual in nature, intimidation and humiliation efforts, and right-wing class remolds, end quote. There is also the reality of what UNICEF, a research project documenting gender-based violence in European universities call organizational violence, where members of the collective, group, and organizational levels of universities and research organizations face harassment and intimidation. For example, gender studies as a discipline frequently faces organizational violence. UNICEF's figures are sobering. Their survey of 42,000 staff and students in European universities show that, quote, 62% have experienced at least one form of gender-based violence, end quote, since they started their studies or started working. LGBTQ survey respondents were 68% more likely to have experienced violence, whereas those who are disabled and who are racialized were respectively 72% and 69% more likely to have faced violence. And now, with students and faculty joining people around the world calling for a ceasefire in Gaza, academics in universities who dare mention Palestine when teaching or who dare sign letters calling for an end to genocide are being cyber harassed, doxxed, and surveilled. And it is not lost on me that those who end up facing the bulk of harassment and threats just for speaking out are Black, Indigenous, and women of color. So over the next few episodes of Academic Aunties, we will be talking directly about the realities of violence that many of us face and what institutions can and should do. The anniversary of the Ecole Polytechnic Massacre, where an anti-feminist shooter murdered 14 women, is coming up on December 6. We believe it is important to draw attention to the ongoing and escalating realities of gendered and racialized violence. We want to make clear, too, that our experiences of violence vary. Our social locations affect the level and intensity of the violence we face. These are hard conversations, but it is important that we name what we are experiencing so we can see that we're not alone. This is part of a systemic problem of gendered racialized violence that is folded into the structures of the institutions where we work. This week, I'm so happy to be able to speak to my dear, dear friend, Dr. Rebecca Major. Becky is an associate professor of political science at the University of Windsor, and she spoke to me about the steps she's had to take to stay safe as an Indigenous scholar. Have a listen. Hi, Becky. Hi, Marcy, for having me. How are you doing today? 
Uh, not too bad. I'm really anxious, but in a good way to talk about this topic because for me, it took a village to get me where I was, but now I had a plethora of experiences that I can now share that hopefully other people can learn without needing an entire village too. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Um, I guess I know the answer to this, but I'll ask it again for our listeners. What have been the nature of some of the threats that you've received? I'll start pre-pandemic because we've got a couple of different scenarios going on, security files in my life. So pre-pandemic, there were some racialized attacks at campus for the University of Windsor. Mm. A lot of it was targeted towards Black students. However, there were comments at the time made about coming to campus and doing things to the Indigenous folks that are also at the University of Windsor. So that was the first time of being here at the University of Windsor and experiencing something to that effect where there was threats of violence and the institution had to respond. Our institution responded by banning or outlawing or however you want to put it, fraternities. So huh. there's no more sororities or fraternities at the University of Windsor because that was a hub for a lot of racialized hate towards faculty, students, and staff. Mm-hmm. So that was the first instant. And that was just kind of like testing ground. Didn't have a lot of interaction in the process on that one because it was handled at the institutional level. Mm-hmm. Then we see that there was a massive increase towards both specifically people of Asian ethnicity and Indigenous backgrounds during the pandemic. So 2020, there was a 152% increase in racialized hate towards Indigenous people alone. I would say in the area that I'm in, we saw with the occupation of the Ambassador Bridge and all those events that took place, in that i think that was 2022 february march 2022 a massive increase since then Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. sometimes it's what some people would call microaggressions and i've had to do mitigation in things in safety that way just on low-key levels and that means protecting my gas in TAs when involved in marking assignments when I get violence from students. Just so our listeners are clear, it's sad that in this conversation we've had to kind of put in a hierarchy of violence, right? So microaggressions would be comments or what do you mean by those? Gaslighting questions. Okay. Or using assignments as platforms to critique Indigenous people in a negative light. Okay. Okay, so not like so, in an academic way, but it's an opportunity to write hateful screeds under the guise of completing the assignments. Yes. Okay. So there's, you know, certain measures I put in place for my TAs and GAs. But when the Windsor Bridge occupation happened, that actually landed things at my doorstep, literally. So I have damage to my front door where someone may have taken a crowbar to it. And I've always taken measures because I have a child to make sure people don't know where my home address is. Yeah. Right. Um, And also during that time, myself, along with other people on campus, were doxxed in emails with students that were participating in the organized activities. Oh, my God. But they did it in a way that outed us two of the people who were, quote unquote, radicalized. I, I'm not there to see everything to make that determination, but allegedly, right? Um, and again, the university had to step in. All the emails were forwarded to them and see everything that was going on that way. Then I had another security issue where I was targeted, and so was a research assistant of mine, um, from people from another province who came oh to Ontario, and that triggered another security file. I don't want to get into the details of that, but I now know what kind of institutional responses we can have. You know, peepholes on doors, hot button phones, mirrors outside the doors, in the corners of the hallways, all sorts of physical safety features that your institution can support you with when you have a safety security issue based on your research, for example, in my case. Um, So there's that. And then also... 
more recently just because, I mean, my hiring was public when it happened. People know that this was part of a targeted hire when I was brought on. So it's no secret who I am in the community. And yeah. it turns out, especially since the pandemic, but especially since the bridge occupation, my family now, because of the work that I do in critical race theory, because I'm the racist that draws attention to racial issues, according to them, <laughs> yeah. I have a whole neighborhood of people that are involved in criminally harassing my family. Oh and my these are all people that, you know, are very much what we would put under the banner of convoy population, people who weaponize the Canada flag and the F. Trudeau flags and, and those sorts. So those types of things, they're all various different things that have created me reasons to have security files on campus, have regular meetings with security and HR on campus, all sorts of measures are in place. And because I know a little bit about risk management from just being a policy geek, I've employed some other tools into, you know, uh, my safety plans. So, you know, having places to go, muster points, human flag pulls to increase my safety measures so people are aware of what's going on. Because the more people that know, the higher your safety goes up, all sorts of things because of the varied experiences. I mean, it it's it's so sad hearing you enumerate all of the different threats and violences you face. What are the effects of constantly having to be vigilant when it comes to your safety, Becky? Honestly, some of these things are things that I've just had to practice my whole life. Okay. Just because so many of people in community and some of my friends have become MMIWG2 as plus missing and murdered individuals. Yeah. I've just always done extra measures. I don't want to, I don't want to get into it. I don't want to talk about it too much, but you know, especially when Megan Gallagher went missing in Saskatoon, uh, you know, that was a good reminder for being more vigilant. Mm. So I've done, I've always done measures. So people know where I am. People know where my location is just so I'm, I'm not a person that gets taken. For sure. My follow-up question is, you know, it's affecting you clearly. It's something you've had to kind of had to do for a long time. How has this affected your family? It's created a lot of change, made me consider other opportunities. So, and as a result, I have now got a wonderful opportunity that I am looking forward to. I have had really good support by and large mm -hmm. from my institution here. But it's clearly like a lot of the failures and what's made it difficult for us to stay has been policing failures. We've had a lot of different situations. I engaged a lot with uh, the local police and it's just now to a point where it was time to make a, a substantial change, unfortunately, and we are, you know, leaving the area now. Absolutely. To what degree has the institution been helpful? Because I think one of the things that I'm discovering is that a lot of institutions just don't know what to do. And a lot of institutions end up gaslighting those of us who face these threats where this can run the gamut between them asking you to repeat your story to different bodies and you're like why do i have to keep recounting the story right like it's actually causing more trauma to individualizing the problem by saying well you know asking questions like did you consider xyz like making it seem as though it's your fault to having solutions such as oh we're going to have a webinar on how to protect yourself all of which i think combined adds to the stress that people who are facing violence face so how was your institution helpful and what can institutions do so i think one of the things that's been was actually hugely helpful through all of this is the fact that it might be because i'm with a smaller institution okay so you have different relationships when you're at a smaller university than sometimes the larger universities i had a lot of support from upper administration and even they're trying to get assistance and connect me to other people that could help get attention to my issue because the police weren't listening. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, hugely responsive when it came to 
physical needs on campus for any time I needed something. When you and I ended up with the situation with one of the work projects that we were on and doxing was starting to happen, my campus was very quick to mobilize to help us to be in the loop on safety nets and all of that, knowing what we should be asking for in the spaces that we're going to be using. So very practically responsive did their best to bring attention to the issue, connect me with the right people, make sure that I had, like, connect me with the right people outside the university, like, right. civically. Yeah. Right? Which is important. Even the College of Law conversations over there, different supports on how to bring something from our current situation, such as maybe a private member's bill based on a loophole that happens to be in the law with one of the course, one of the problems that we're dealing with. So I've had a lot of really good support that way, even to try and help us find, you know, an emergency situation for housing, should we need it, you know, if we have to leave quickly. And some of the, my, you know, human flag poles, as I call them, because that's, you know, kind of what they're considered in risk management, were some of the people in upper administration at the university. So having you know, people who you trust, who are aware of the tool, these violent threats have taken and being proactive has really helped. So, so they believed you, right? They were like, we absolutely believe well, you. We see you. Right. And they know for an indigenous person to need to approach police, that is not our first go-to. We no. have a lot of institutional distrust. So if we're trying to work with police. You know that there's a problem that needs to be taken seriously. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I guess my question is, I've received a lot of people reaching out and saying, we're getting a lot of death threats, doxing, but also these letters, these emails contain really specific threats, such as we're going to find you where you're teaching and we're going to beat you up. We're going to, you know, (laughs) sexually assault you. And some of them have even mentioned the classroom locations where some of my friends are teaching because these are available online, right? And a lot of this, most of this actually that I've been privy to lately has been connected to people's support for a ceasefire and support for Palestine. I guess my question, Becky, is what can institutions do proactively to make sure that faculty members are kept safe? So like most of my stuff, on the institutions been scrubbed from the website. You won't find very much on me except for maybe an odd little old piece of information which finds its way up and is like assistant professor and it's like old stuff, right? But we have a provost that is making changes currently to remove all of the location data and all that stuff that you can't actually have access to that unless you're registered in the classroom. And so there's a lot of extra safety measures that are being brought in at my institution, they've done some reorganizing as far as policing on campus, as well as creating different relationships with the Windsor Police Force. So there's a lot of protections that have been put in place. But there's one now that I have a new recommendation that I've decided is important. And I ran this by another faculty member who is also a racialized scholar who has also had problems with the police. When you are working at a university, you're usually not working in your hometown, Mm -mm. which means you don't have your community of support locally. Yeah. And if you're new and you've only been around for three to five years and half of that time was a pandemic or, you know, especially a lockdown portion of a pandemic where we were working from home and those things, you haven't had a lot of time to network. Mm -hmm. This is what I want universities to do. If a faculty person finds themselves in a situation where they need to interact with police, they should be allowed, just like anybody who gets po- is about to be pulled over on the street and you're allowed to wait till you're in a safe, open area with plenty of lighting to be pulled over. If you have someone that's police coming to your door, you should be allowed to have somebody from the university, maybe your campus security, liaise to your house. So you have someone there that's there as your, on your behalf Mm. to be your witness and advocate to what's going on. So, you know, if suddenly police show up, you can say, excuse me, officer. Yes, I will open the door. Please give me five to seven minutes. I am a university employee and I have the right to have my support person present when I talk with you. 
and they are on their way, right? And then you have someone there because otherwise you can get into situations where you end up victim blamed, textbook sentences by police and not believed. Absolutely. So having like a community of support, people who can come and provide witnessing support, right? Especially for faculty members who live in cities and towns where they don't know anyone, right? People who know the area, know the community. I think that's a great idea. It's interesting, right? Like on the one hand, absolutely institutions should you know, be more proactive by providing community witnessing or community advocate circle or whatever, that's great. I think it's great that they should be proactive in making sure that only students who are registered in the classes know where classroom locations are. The fact that these are still publicly available on websites that anyone can access is bullshit. This is one of the ways that the Waterloo attacker <laughs> found the classroom where that gender studies class was being taught, right? So these are these are all good measures. But I guess my question is, what happens when the threats come from within, right? Like, what happens when you're, you're, you're being harassed by colleagues, you're being harassed by members of the campus community, dare I even say students, right? Which racialized Indigenous Black faculty members, especially those who are trans and women, experience too. Like, what do we do then? So my biggest obstacle in certain spaces is students. And so what I've done with my syllabus is I've put in social contracts. Okay. What do those look and like? Explain, so for me, I explained that gaslighting will not be tolerated in big, bold letters, asterisks, all of that. And right underneath it, I provide them in the syllabus, a link to the student code of conduct. Mm -hmm. And then just some general decorum rules for being, for respectful behavior. Because otherwise I can end up with some situations in the class that are really hard to measure where students are saying, you know, horrible things where I've had that happen. I've had to step up and, and stop those conversations immediately. But there are also things that we can't control. Yeah. Right. Like mm -hmm. the student social media that they see of each other's outside the classroom. And that's changed a lot of the student dynamics and relationships in recent times. I think that's what's hard, right? Because I think, you know, I've certainly had encounters with students who get really upset about my presence, but also about the course content, right? I remember one class, and it's always going to be etched in my memory, where a student basically got so angry about the course content, which that week we were talking about anti-Black racism and we were talking about the movements for Black lives. And the student got really, really triggered and had an angry exit, but he was also like, I don't know, you know when you know when someone's getting really riled up and he like stands up and you're like, oh my gosh, what's going on, right? And, you know, I'm not going to narrate everything that happened, but it did kind of make me aware that, you know, especially in these like fraught political times where there's a lot of misinformation afoot, where political leaders are supporting uh, the dehumanization of our communities, right? You know, we are public facing uh, workers, right? So we, sometimes students do take what you say to heart and take it personally and threaten you. And so, you know, the institution in that sense did kind of give me a safety plan, which was good. But at the same time, I know that that, that physical threat, you know, that, that was something that the university was able to control. But I also know that at least in like websites and at least in kind of social media postings, I've also been kind of, you know, maligned. <laughs> Um, and we can't control that, right? And my suspicion would be these are students who, you know, are frustrated. Um, and I would argue that, you know, this is also an extension of the violence that we face. Like, we've all read kind of some of the comments that we would receive in in in, in these social media sites, right? I'm not going to repeat them here, but but that's beyond our control. And that's just something I can't accept. I don't know. Maybe I'm just kind of feeling really vulnerable here. Well, the thing is, universities invite people to come and be part of their community and work for them. So mm -hmm. they need to have a level of responsibility for the people they're inviting in and understand that there are consequences that are associated for some of us yeah, just in the nature of our work. Mm -hmm. 
and depending on the political climate at the time. Mm -hmm. Right. So there are people in medicine that were targeted during the pandemic and it became unsafe for doctors and nurses to go to work some days, Mm -hmm. you know, and there's literal physical safety risks for doing your job. And so some of that needs to be considered by these institutions. My institution did as much as they could. The union was also very supportive. You know, it's not very often administration and unions are on the same page, but they both were in my institution with what was going on with me. And they were trying to do what they could within their means. But knowing that moving forward, institutions need to have maybe more measures built into their collective agreements, like the, you know, idea of having the community liaison or finding other ways to protect the employees that they want to bring in and highlight and showcase for their research, because there's consequences for being that public person. So two things I want to follow up on, right? First, this is what's funny, being like, you know, a racialized scholar, Canada research chair, my research gets splashed all over, I don't know, my institution's website. They benefit from showing that, oh, look, look, we have like a racialized CRC. So on the one hand, it's like they benefit from our presence, right? And and likewise with you, look at Professor Rebecca Major, look at these grants that she's received, top Indigenous scholars. So we are making institutions look good by our presence and through our work, right? But on the other hand, it seems to me as though, at least in my institution, although I think it's changing, it doesn't go the other way where, you know, you're only going to be celebrated for your research accomplishments, but you don't get safety measures to correspond with with the public role that you're expected to play. Do you know what I mean? And so this is kind of the disconnect, right? <laughs> well, this is it because universities are supposed to be hubs of thought yeah. where we grow ideas. And that's often where people at certain times and periods of history are seen as radicals, where down the road that just becomes part of society and how society rolls, right? Because society evolves. But you have to have those thinkers at your institutions. Well, we know that thinkers are targeted and it's globally. We've seen this happen with international people for, you know, generations where you have people having to leave their home countries because they're targeted at home and can risk going to jail. Our yeah, university has at risk. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So we have a scholar at risk in our department right now. And there you know, that is part of the job. And it's not like we get extra life insurance and other <laughs> benefits built in. <laughs> Right. (laughs) But I mean, really, there's literally just by our presence on campus as people that are contentious based on the political, you know, ideology or what's going on in the temperament. We need job protection. Unfortunately, that these days means protection from society at times. Yeah. See, this is where the disconnect happens too. like universities, uh, every single bloody university um, has, at least in Canada, has a commitment to diversify, to indigenize, to decolonize, right? And in so doing, they are opening the doors, having all of these initiatives, which are great, actually. I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I criticize them, but I think in theory, diversifying institutions to make sure that faculty members uh, bring in a wealth of diverse knowledges, but also represent diverse communities, that's great, right? But it seems as though workplace practices, including with respect to safety, haven't haven't adapted in the same way. So in other words, universities haven't had to think about the nature of these gendered, racialized, anti-Indigenous threats because historically, universities didn't have us. And now they have to think about us because we're here. And so institutions are having a hard time catching up. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Like We need to change the way we do things. I was at uh, a workshop in, in Calgary this fall and hearing that burnout rates are, you know, a year and a half now, used to be three years for racialized Indigenous scholars. Now we're looking at a year and a half for burnout rates. Oh my God. Well, it's not only workload and emotional labor, it's all this other stuff that comes with it. Absolutely. I guess final question, that's something a little bit more practical, right? Um, If there is a listener who has been getting doxxed heavily, if they're seeing that their inbox is a cesspool, what are some of the steps that they have to do to ensure that their workplaces, i.e. colleges and universities, safeguard their interests, right? 
Because I think a lot of people just don't know. Well, first of all, a lot of people don't know that they can ask institution for support. Like you don't have to carry this alone. But what's step one that they should do? They're receiving a shit ton of hate mail. Who should they contact? What should they do? Yeah. So first thing I would recommend is actually taking, going one step back and just think of it as safeguarding yourself. Okay. Because you don't know where this is going to go and you don't know if this is going to go beyond campus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So you might have to deal with local police or, or law enforcement. You might have to deal with ombudsman, MPs, whatever the situation is. There's all sorts of different places you might end up having to deal with this. So the very first thing I would say is, Start a document index list mm. just to be able to actually document what's happening to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I'm work trying and working with police and I'm providing evidence with my video evidence and photos or whatever I'm providing, I also provide them with a document index list with events and with the corresponding file number of the video that I'm giving them. Mm -hmm. You can do the same with emails, but if you can start tracking things right away, then it's not the slippery slope, but things will get away from you. That can happen. And if you lose a couple of days of documenting, it's fine. Don't worry about mm -hmm. it. Don't beat yourself up over it, but do your best to look after it. It is really, it can be traumatic. It can be really hard, really hard to sit down and do it. If you need to set time aside every morning that you're making sure you've got everything documented, especially if you're right in the middle of an, what I would call an event. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sometimes you, you're dealing with an, a, a bigger situation where within that bigger situation, you're dealing with specific events, mm -hmm. right? If it's an ongoing harassment situation. So the first thing is to document. The second thing is to let your chair know what you're, what's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let your chair know, let your union rep know. Mm -hmm. let mm -hmm. campus security know and mm -hmm. if you need to put all three of them on the same email mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. there might even be somebody in hr that should also be on that email and you can even mention in that email should there be anybody from hr that should be part of a safety plan please let me know i mm -hmm. think i'm in need of a safety plan mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or even mm -hmm. be more assertive depending on what your relationship is but if so if you're approaching people saying yeah this is going on i'm pretty sure i need a safety plan they should be taking you seriously yeah you're an safety academic. plan absolutely that's kind of the key right? word so I, I think bef before i talked to you i didn't know what a safety plan was i've never heard of that term and i was like okay safety plan safety plan right and so depending on the circumstances safety plan can mean different things it could mean you know having exit strategies from your office it can have all those physical things in place it could be the lack of physical things in place, like wiping all your information from the internet. I don't do as much with social media as I used to. It doesn't help that X has been ruined in some respects in my world. <laughs> yeah, no. uh, right. That was a good cure for it in itself. But the safety plan, and then make sure that there are people that you have that are your touchstones in your institution. Have colleagues you trust that are your touchstones. Right. So you have people to check in on. Uh, find out if any of your colleagues would be willing to come with you to be with you at police. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's another mm -hmm. thing. Make sure you're not alone with law enforcement. And in all honesty, if your faculty specifically, like campus security should be believing you. Like they mm -hmm. are there to be supporting you. That's what that should be happening. But yeah, make sure there's people in upper, upper administration that know. Um, and the safety plan, those types of things are the biggest pieces. And be aware. Don't be scared to report because a lot of the things that happen with racialized indigenous, indigenous people is you're dealing with situations where people are making you doubt yourself on whether or not you're seeing what's really happening to you, which is also part of gaslighting with questioning whether or not that you're experiencing this, questioning if it's as bad as you think it is, self-doubt. Do your best. I don't like to tell people how to feel, but do your best to push that self-doubt aside have somebody that you think can actually give you reflection if you're if you're not sure of what's actually happening with you right now. But jump into action right away. Make it as easy on yourself as possible by start documenting early and as often as you can. 
It's so sad that we have to have a list, but we have to have a list, right? I mean, I feel like this list is so essential for all faculty members, especially for racialized Indigenous Black faculty members. All of us are entitled to a safe working environment. We shouldn't be working in an environment that's unsafe. And the only thing, I think this is something you've covered already, but I would also reinforce that having a look at the collective agreement, if you're unionized, because there are provisions regarding workplace safety, right? And also, I know that there are some unions that aren't necessarily supportive, (laughs) to be honest. Finding people in the union who are part of maybe an equity committee and asking them for advice too, if you find that your union rep's not supportive. Because I think what's hard is that some of the nature of these threats, because they're gendered, racialized, gendered, and anti-Indigenous threats of violence. I've heard of cases where unions are like, well, you know, that's not really part of kind of our job, right? Like it's not, you know, because they're not really as concerned with you being docs because of you participating in a protest, right? Like I've heard of unions saying that's not part of what we're supposed to be here for, to represent you for. So in other words, if you're not getting the support you need from the people who are supposed to support you, then finding others who can. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, it does. And it's also why when I send some emails out in certain spaces, and I'm not saying necessarily at the university, but dealing with some of these situations for sure more broadly, I have more than one person on the email. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So they know other people are watching. Yeah. But it can't be swept under the rug. Right. So that in itself is another safety net. Yeah, absolutely. And I also think just to add to this list as well, if if it's getting to be too much, right? Like if you're getting so many threats, I have heard of institutions offering to have someone, maybe an employee well-being or whatever the department's called, um, or even asking, you know, if if they don't have this, this, this department or program, even asking trusted colleagues to take over your inbox and having them be the ones to sift through the threats and do the documentation. I hear that's an option too. Yeah, all of these are interesting steps, important steps, but I'm so, I feel like dissatisfied too, because it's so individualized and I'm just like, oh my God, fuck the violence. It's making me so mad. We just want to do our jobs. Like, ugh, you know, that's it. And the thing is, it's such a scale and it, it feels sometimes like it's no matter where you turn, it's something, but it's because there's so many various ways that this can come at you. You know, know, and it chips away at you and it exhausts you. Yeah. It's exhausting. And in your case, leaving was the option, right? (laughs) Like it's like for your family. And yeah, that's what's that's what's really grim. But right. I think talking about it is important. And so any last bits of insider advice you'd like to offer, Becky? Ah, yeah. Just honestly, one of the best things you can do is look at different risk management ideas and compositions because different situations will always be slightly different, right? Well, you have, for a variety of reasons, but if you feel like you're, you know, entering in this space, make sure you have that person that you can check in with that can help you see what's going on and just make sure that you are taking precautions because not everybody takes seriously how fast these can come into physical acts of violence. A lot Mm -hmm. of people dismiss it as, oh, it's just keyboard warriors, but it's never worth the risk. And statistically, if things escalate, they're only going to keep escalating. A hundred percent. And I think, honestly, like, if there's anything I'm taking out of this conversation, there's also something, I wouldn't say hopeful because this is not hopeful, right? But the fact that enough of us are talking about it, we've had a lot of group chats about the violence that we're facing. There is something strong about coming together and kind of just articulating that we're all facing this and that we all have the right to demand our institutions, our workplaces, protect us and to do better, right? They are accountable to us and we should make these demands. So yeah, thank you so much, Becky. Thank you. I'm glad to talk. I know it's hard to say those, but again, you know, like it's not a happy topic, but I'm really hoping that people can learn from the village it took me to learn so that, you know, they can get the cliff's notes if it happens to them. 
As I reflect on Becky's insights, I can see more clearly how any analysis of gender-based violence cannot ignore how structures of colonialism, white supremacy, and patriarchy affect everyday experiences. And so widening our analysis to understand the impacts of these structures and these colonial legacies is necessary, so we don't propose crude and simplistic solutions that invariably inflict more harm. For example, as Becky asserts, many indigenous communities distrust the police. Thus, ensuring greater campus safety by asking for a stronger police presence will not work. Can institutions be held accountable? What if the institutions that we're in, unlike Becky's experience, has actually been completely unsupportive? What do we do then? We discuss these questions and more in our next episode. For now, what I will say to listeners who have faced or are facing violence in the academy, you are not alone. And I believe you. And that's Academic Antis for this week. Academic Antis is produced by me, Dr. Ethel Tunkohan, Wayne Chu, and Dr. Anisha Nath. Follow us on all social media. We're at, at Academic Anti on Twitter and Academic Antis everywhere else. Rate and review us wherever you get your podcast. And email us anytime at podcast at academicantis.com. Tune in next time when we talk to more Academic Antis. Until then, take care, be kind to yourselves, and don't be an asshole.